So, um, he looks up at her eyes and that's it. Happy and proud, at last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. He's waited for this moment when he is absolutely certain that she really cares about him and she feels drawn to him even when she's with others. And she's left them, maybe risked everything to leave the feast where she's supposed to be and come and visit him and be with him and start to seduce him. And he's proud that somebody like this would love him so much. At last, and look at this word he uses, she worshipped me. Um, it's interesting. I'm not quite convinced that from his description of how she behaved, that she quite worshipped him. She might have passionately um, been drawn to him. Um, however, it's not quite the same as worshipping someone. But in any case, he interprets it as her worshipping him. He begins to see himself. as godlike. Does he have a complex here that he believes that um, he is, he's been elevated to the status of a god? She's looking up to him, worshipping him. This is a really interesting choice of verb because of its religious connotations. Mainly because later on in the poem, we'll be able to match something else that he says with this verb. OK, surprise made my heart swell and still it grew while I debated what to do. Interesting. Then. He's surprised and delighted. He's surprised and delighted that she is, uh, that she loves him. Um, uses that metaphor there to demonstrate that pride and delight. Quite a cliched metaphor as well. Still it grew, but then he says, well, I debated what to do. What an interesting choice of verb. This here now is quite a formal, cold verb. He's thinking quite seriously. What, what, shall, I, what shall I do about this? What will I do next? Um, that moment she was mine, mine, fair. So she is beautiful, fair. She's mine, he repeats mine. Um, sounding a little bit like he's a little bit out of control, if you ask me. She was mine, mine. He needs to possess her. Maybe at this point he's thinking about how he can't really possess her. For this moment, she's mine. But she has said that she is not going to be able to marry him. She made that. We, we got that impression earlier on when it said um, she she wasn't she was too weak to give herself to him forever and really throw off all of the um, restraints of society permanently. But in that moment, perfectly pure and good. This is interesting because he's using that um, plosive alliteration again. Perfectly pure. Um, and this time it means something completely different. It's a contrast with the previous uh, plosive alliteration. Because whilst she was talking before about passion prevailing, here, he's talking about how she's pure and good.
and she hasn't yet given herself to him. She might have been trying to seduce him, but they, they haven't had sex, to put it bluntly. Um, fair means beautiful. She's perfect. She's pure. She's good. In this moment, he's just thinking what he's going to do with this. I found a thing to do. So finally, this is Yura here with the colon. He thinks about what he's going to do next. And we're probably thinking to ourselves, is he going to give in and have sex with her um, and, and take away her virginity? Maybe when um, when this would obviously could destroy her. But she's the one who came round um, and she's the one who has been, it seems, doing all the running. She's come out to see him in the middle of the night, in the middle of a party um, at night time. She's come to visit him. Um, is he going to give in or isn't he? He says, I found a thing to do. And all her hair in one long yellow string, I wound three times a, a little, her little throat around and strangled her. So, the thing that he's decided to do, having um, calculated his next move, is actually quite a shock to us. Because what he's decided to do, the best thing to do, is murder her. And when we look at this poem, what's it really interesting is the fact that this is such a shock and he kind of hides it in the first half of a line and just carries on without a beat with just a short sazira from a full stop no pain felt she i'm quite sure she felt no pain but obviously to the reader it's an absolute shock um that this is the thing he decides to do at this precise moment in time and interestingly what he does is he he, he kind of um, puts off that moment of telling us what he's going to do by describing the long yellow string I wound three times. So he's he's keeping the reader in suspense. Um, in one long one long yellow string I wound three times around her little throat her little throat around now often we're going to see now this these this language being used that makes her seem small perhaps even doll like diminutive um no pain felt she i'm quite sure she felt no pain and he's repeating to himself perhaps to convince himself that she uh, that she felt no pain And then next we have this um, very clever simile. So simple, but all the best ones are. Um, as a shut bud that holds a bee, I warily oped her lids again. Um, beautiful simile. So what he's doing on a literal level is he's opening her eyes, um, sort of pulling them open again, warily, um, and looking to see what the eyes are doing underneath, which we'll come on to in a moment. Now, so many things in this line. First of all, we have, he's comparing the eyes to being like a shut bud that holds a bee, more plosive alliteration. which I think um, the sound of that place of alliteration sort of underpins that actually he, there's some brutality in there in that tone. So he's saying she's felt no pain. There's a shut bud that holds a B and, and look at this consonants here. Quite a harsh tone from that. Um, 
but also the inside the, the when you think about what that simile means continuing this idea here um that image it's like a flower so a symbol perhaps of purity uh a symbol of um in some ways also female sexuality flowers opening buds opening is often uh, linked to the idea of female sexuality whilst simultaneously being linked with the idea of something beautiful and pure uh, and natural but inside that female sexuality lurks danger in the form of a bee So the idea that, well, although she's very beautiful, inside there is um, there is danger. So the idea that she um, that that women's sexuality is dangerous and can lead to no good, and that you can be sucked in um, to thinking that they're beautiful, but inside there's a sting coming. Inside, he um, when he opens her eyes, again, laughed the blue eyes without a stain. So he, he's sort of a bit tentative using this adverb here. He's not quite sure what he's going to find warily. But once he's opened his eyes, he's really quite relieved because what he sees is that the blue eyes are laughing without a stain. So, um, so they're still pure and still laughing. He untightens next the tress about her neck. Her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. So he unwinds the hair. He's killed her. He's untightened the tress. Um, let me just change colours so you can see that. He untightens the tress about her neck. But inside, um, and and what would happen if she was alive was that her heart would be beating and the, and the blood would start pumping around her face actually that probably wouldn't happen if she was dead and yet he sees the blush burning bright again beneath the the blush the blush of her cheek beneath his burning kiss So we are now moving into the realms of his imagination. Her eyes are still laughing, her cheek is still blushing. In fact, everything's perfect. He propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still. In, in many ways then, the roles have been reversed. Whereas before, she was the one with the power over him. He was here, lovesick, all by himself, waiting in case she came. She was saying that I can't say that I'll love you forever, but I can be with you tonight. That's all been reversed now. Um, he is propping her head on his shoulder the smiling rosy little head again more of this uh, diminutive description doll like so unlike before when she was sexual now um she is um, like a doll, like something pure, like something childlike. 
and um, he has moved now from having propped up her head. Her head droops upon it still. And now we're in the present tense. So he's writing this poem at some point after he's killed her and he's still sitting there with the head of the dead woman on his shoulder. The smiling little head so glad it has its utmost will it, that it's scorned, that all it's scorned at once is fled. Everything that it, it hated is gone. And instead, she's got him. OK, so he really is quite delusional, isn't he? Earlier on, he was talking about her worshipping him. And now he's basically saying that she must be really happy now because she doesn't have to live according to social convention anymore and she can actually have him forever. So he's doing her a favour. Um, everything she hated is gone. And I, and I, she says, it's love I'm gained instead. Porphyria's love. She guessed not how her darling one wish would be heard. So he seems quite entertained. Um, by the idea that she's achieved her, her dream of being with him. In an unexpected way. OK. Um, and thus we sit together now. All night long we have not stirred. OK. So they're sitting together even at this, at this moment in time. This repetition of and at the end. These are all, this is all the things that are happening at this moment. And thus we sit together now, and all night long we have not stirred, and yet God has not said a word. In other words, he's been listening carefully, but God hasn't said anything. There's been no judgment. There's been no divine retribution. There's been no punishment from God. And this is a, a really interesting um, idea. Just a quick note on the punctuation there. It, it, again, he seems sort of pleasantly surprised that God hasn't said anything to him. Almost like, there you go. Obviously, I did the right thing. Obviously, it was the correct thing to do. The poem's really interesting because it ends with this idea that, that God has not stepped in to punish him. And at the end of this poem... He feels like he has saved her from sin by murdering her and kept her pure and virginal um, and therefore that he has done the right thing. And preserved a pure moment when she worshipped him um, and that, that, that there is going to be no punishment. Actually, if you begin to look at this poem on a deeper level, then is this about him being mad? Is there a question here from Robert Browning about the whole nature of Christianity and the whole nature of um, of right and wrong and morality and so on um, those are questions you're going to need to think about quite deeply um, but certainly at the end of the poem he believes he has rescued this woman from the um, expectations of Victorian society 
and also from her hidden wicked passions and he believes he's done the right thing.